How you doing, man? Hey, Jason. How are you? I'm doing great. I have a great wife. I thank God for her. We know that you have a great wife. This is, this <laughs> is the truth that has been shared with this audience. So I am glad to hear that. Um, I'm going to give us a, a minute or two to see if folks join us today. This is our maiden voyage, so we'll see how this goes. Okay. And definitely and, uh, looking forward to being back again. Yeah, yeah. We had a good time that first time. That first chat was really transformative, not just for um, me personally, but for our audience. We got a lot of great feedback from your interview. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to people joining us for this chat or catching up with us, actually, um, you know, when we post it later. So, okay. yeah. But uh, thank you for working through the storm to get here. I work with my own storm to get here, so that's a good thing, too. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> that's good. All right, so I'm going to give it a beat. And see what happens, because it's just you and I right now. Oh, wait, how, who is this? Lily Stone. Lily Stone. Yeah. Is that one of your people? Oh, it could be. It could very well be. Sometimes the ID names and then we you they don't always call like, okay. Yeah. That was you. Right. <laughs> right. But hey Lily Stone, nice to see you. Yeah, let's see. In the interest of time, because I know you have things to do today, I'm just going to get started um, and just go through our format um, so that when people get this a little later, they, they all know what we were up to. Is that okay. good? Sounds good. Okay, cool. So welcome to Amplify America's first IG Live. I am so grateful that you all are here. Um, I'm April Yvonne Garrett, and I'm the founder of of Amplify America. It is a movement that highlights social issues, the people affected by them, and the people working to find solutions to our nation's most pressing problems. Um, I also hope that you're here because you're an amplifier, that you're interested in making a difference in your community through informed action um, and a diligent commitment to sustainable change. So thanks for being here. Um, I also hope you had a chance to listen to this episode. Um, it was on emotional and psychological abuse, and I know that it's a heavy topic. Um, I got a lot of feedback from people being like, okay, you weren't playing. You just came out with, like, the guns blazing. And um, and I, I know that it was, is, it was intense, and I'm hoping that, you know, you were able to access your curiosity um, to allow you to be guided through such an intense issue. Um, in all honesty, the reason that I wanted to do emotional and psychological abuse um, are both personal and a matter of efficacy. And I'll start with the efficacy part. Um, the first episodes of this podcast in total, I planned on focusing and examining domestic and intimate partner violence sexual trauma, human trafficking, and elder abuse. During my research and while connecting with experts on those matters, it became abundantly clear to me that emotional and psychological abuse was the gateway to all of them. Personally, as a survivor of this type of abuse and other types of abuse, unfortunately, I am all too aware of the corrosive power and how difficult it is to identify and combat. So like any good student, I decided to start with the fundamentals. I appreciate how difficult it was for many of you to engage this topic. I got so many text messages from people saying, I had to stop, I had to pause, I listened to Jason, and then I took a pause, and then I went into Dr. Carter, and then I took another pause to the end. So I really do appreciate how uncomfortable um, this topic was for a lot of people. And um, I hope that that discomfort that you felt gave birth to a greater sense 
of empathy and compassion and understanding of what you can do to combat this issue in your own important relationships, personally, professionally, and communally. Um, you know, we only explored in this particular episode what it looked like in the space of an intimate relationship, but we know that this is showing up in society in multiple ways. So I do want you guys to kind of think about those things. So today I am delighted to introduce you to Jason Micah Covington. He is a worship and production director who currently resides in Virginia. Um, Jason, I thought you were like a dream first real person guest. Um, I want you to know how important it was for me to have you be someone on the show who had already like really grappled with this issue, had gone through a certain level of like acknowledgement and work that you had done and come out on the other side. And I know that that's not the easiest thing to do. So I just wanted you to know that you moved a lot of people with your, with your sharing and um, your vulnerability, lots of comments about your vulnerability. Um, and I am just really grateful that you are here to spend some time with us today. So let's jump into it. Welcome and thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. All right. So what? Okay. So we had our own little vibe during the interview. Um, it's funny because a lot of my friends were like, "We miss conversational April. We don't know if we like NPR April," which is funny because they're like in the interview. I was kind of like a lot more staid, but I really. Um, am committed to making sure that when I invite people co to come on the show, either as experts or advocates or people who have had particular experiences, I really want you to insert my own stuff. So tell me what it was like being interviewed about something so remarkably personal to you. It was, and again, thank you, um, Ms. April, for having me um, be a part of this conversation. Um, I, I love that we're just gonna have a, a regular conversation. Everybody here, y'all just wanna kinda get into, you know, the conversation me and April have. Um, it was a myriad of different feelings. It was, um, if you hear Jets, I live in an area where we have a lot of maneuvers happening. Um, I hear. <laughs> so, um, it was, it was surreal. I think to, it's so many other adjectives <clears throat> that I could use, but it was surreal. Because I remember when I, I told my wife, I said, you know, um, you know, you reached out to me and told me, asked me about doing this. Um, and I think it was through uh, another relative that referred me and connected us together. And then I told my wife that I was going to go ahead and do it. And she was like, are you sure? <laughs> like, because it's like she knows everything. Um, and, you know, and we'll talk to, later on about like my counselor. They, they know everything. But it's a different type of vibe when you open up to the world um and you let them know what was going on um especially being a male and a, a many not just a male but being a black male um and admitting these truths um so i think the one word i would use is surreal and especially like when i heard the sound bites i was like "Ooh, that's rough <laughs> like like dude how are you still smiling um and I don't know, we had some conversations offline, um, but it was just like, I guess it was also liberating to, to talk about those things, to be open and honest. And like um, I shared with you, I wish my former you know, wife well, like 100%. I want her to be a, a millionaire out here, you know, stunning the streets wearing red bottoms. I wish no ill will on her, um, and we'll talk about later too, um, about how I own certain parts of that, not certain, all the parts that I had. And I looked at it from a holistic standpoint. So um, I guess that's a long answer to give you the one word answer being, it was really surreal, really surreal. So you talked a little bit about how close to you, your wife was like, wait, you said all of that? You just told all your stuff? How, how did other people, who were your loved ones, your friends, your colleagues, you know, when they heard it, how, do you, how did they respond to you? They were not surprised because I'm an extrovert. They were not surprised that I was as open as I was. They were surprised that I, I chose to share in this space um, because I believe we all have a story and our stories um, are not just for us, it's to help other people but other people in a small setting. But having this conversation in a way where like legitimately any, anybody that has internet access can hear 
um, and C, they they hear your business. So like it's like now I got somebody over in Europe in Virginia hearing what 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 what's going on. Um, so they were just surprising in that regards that I was okay with opening up in um, uh, almost unlimited way of being able to be touched. But they were not surprised of the candor and they were not surprised uh, at me, at what I shared. Because, I mean, they were here doing a whole deal. Um, so, you know, they, they were <laughs> they were pre pleasantly surprised. Good, good. Um, reflecting back on what we discussed, is there any aspect of the interview that you were like, oh man, I wish I had said this, or I should, I want to say this differently, or let me expand upon that. Is, is there any of that that you want to share? I do. Um, I, and I, I definitely wanted, you know, to also focus a lot of this conversation on the recovery. Um, as you see behind me, uh, Family Functions, that's, that's a podcast that my wife and I, we do and where we discuss this topic and more, but we discuss it not from the lens of, like I shared last time, bashing the former spouses, um, ex-wife, ex-husband, but like saying what it was like for us being, being involved in it, what, what it felt like, what it smelled like, what, what was the sound, what was the overall vibe. Um, another thing I, I definitely wanted to uh, expound upon even more here, um, when we, I really do truly believe there's levels to these forms of, of abuse. I think you have abusers that are intentional, that um, that is their goal to set out and like put their thumb on you. I also think it's the, the level that I really feel, and again, I, I want to really give context, that I experienced. I don't think that my ex-wife set out to be abusive. I don't think that was her heart. I don't think that was when we got married, she's like, I'm going, I'm going to stick it to this joker. I believe, because a lot of it, um, even in the way I, I acclimated and the way I was able to get through it and when I was married previously, I thought it was a joke. I thought, like, she's just playing. Um, so it wasn't, like, while some of the things were malicious, some of the things were hurtful, I, 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 to this day, I still don't believe that this one of of the beast we're talking about today that I was in was intentional to say I'm I'm an abuser. It was more um because we got married extremely young. Um and we had wise counsel that we did not listen to. So a lot of the guardrails that could have been and should have been in place um were not in place. Um so I, I definitely want to give context to, to people but and but not excuse the behavior because it was still inexcusable. And because you also have people that are going through it and the, their spouses or significant others, their intention is to be abusive, is to be hurtful, is to minimize the light that other person um, shares. So I, I don't want to, I don't want you, if you're in that moment now, to feel like, okay, Jason just gave me a license to stay here. It's cool. No, no, no. If you, if this is happening and you feel less than, um, while I'm, I'm, a ne I'm never an advocate for divorce, um, if you're married, but I, I almost I am an advocate of doing what you need to do to be holistically well, um, and if that encompasses if you're married and divorce, for you to be good, you need to do what you need to do. Um, do not stay and make excuses for behavior that you feel that that is unacceptable. Um, challenge the behavior, speak to the behavior, and expect to change. If that change doesn't happen, now you have to do something different. Um, the word that we throw around a lot of times, or the, the term, um, and Sandy is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. A lot of times we do that in relationships. We stay in relationships and hope for the best, but we never do the work for it to get better. And if we're on our side doing what we feel like is getting it better, but not seeing the fruitfulness or the fruits of that, we stay. Um, I want to speak to and challenge that uh, mindset and that behavior. Again, I am for a proponent for a holistic and wholesome marriages. Um, I'm, I'll never say get married with the end goal that you can get divorced, but divorce may be the option you need to take or not being with that person. Because a lot of times, um, April, we see these tendencies in the courtship. 
Um, I'm telling my age because the young people now say, like, you know, I'm hollering at her when we date. Um, but, you know, when I started dating, we were courting and all that kind of stuff. And that's a lost art. And that's a whole other show. Um, right. But we see those behaviors there. But we make excuses and say, and, and we, as I said in the other show, we marry or we stay with potential. We never get with the reality. And when I, what I mean when I say that is um, if you're with somebody and they are who they are, ask yourself realistically, can you spend the rest of your life being with this person in this moment and be 100% happy? If the answer is no, then now you need to start exploring different things. Again, not saying separation, divorce, or leaving them, but you need to have some hard conversations. And I think us as a people, not just um, when I talk about ethnicity, but people in general, we don't want to have those hard conversations because it, it causes us to look in the mirror and see what did we do? What is our ownership in this moment? Uh, and that, those are some things that um, I'm really candid uh, with, with my wife on our podcast, Family Functions, where we, we, we talk about the things, not from the other side, but what, we, what it was for us and how we had to learn to survive and cope in those moments. Did you, in the space of your first marriage, where you know these behaviors that were abusive came up, and, and, and the, if you listen to the podcast, I'm hoping everybody did listen to the podcast, um, you will know that, that Jason talked about specific incidences and the frequency with which they occurred um, around his family, around his friends, and even professionally, and the impact that they had on him, um, and his viability as a human being, but also his viability as a, a husband and a caregiver. Um, you said that you ignored a lot of counsel um, and you also were a part of a community that, you know, where it's kind of assumed that you would have a, a certain amount of, of give and take on this, you know, being a part of a church community, right? Did it ever occur to you in your first marriage to seek therapy or counseling? Not until it was too late. Um, by the time I, um, being transparent, by the time I sought real counseling, um, and when I say real counsel, I mean someone that's licensed and that is trained to deal with these traumas, um, these difficult situations. Um, and I'm a man of faith. Um, so this uh, is no knock to the pastors and preachers um, that pastor churches and give pastoral counseling. But you, you need to be careful where you get your counsel from, because if you're not careful and if you go to your pastor or leader in your spiritual place for counseling, the familiarity um, often breeds contempt, where now if this is my pastor, I'm going and talk to him about me and my you know, former wife's problem. If his allegiance lies with me, now she's automatically on guard. So we did things like that, but that wasn't beneficial. Um, it wasn't until I went to a licensed professional counselor um, that I started to see a lot of these things that were in me that I need to deal with that stem from childhood that I carried into manhood um, that never really matured or uh, developed the way they needed to. Um, so counseling for me was great and it worked, but I think how I did it earlier and the work was done pre-marriage, uh, um, one of two things would have happened. Either we would not have gotten married or we would have gotten married with a, a higher sense of knowledge of what to do and what not to do. Um, the, again, those guard, guardrails, if you will. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a strict advocate for professional counseling. Um, a few weeks ago, I graduated my master's in counseling. So I, holistically, um, thank you, thank you so much. Please, everybody needs a counselor. I don't care if you, 100, you feel like you're good, there's something that you can be better at. Amen. Um, yeah. we, we take our car for routine maintenance, oil changes, tire rotations. We go to the gym, yes. even though I need to go back to the gym, I'm real heavy now with quarantine weight. We go for maintenance, lifting weights and running and all that kind of stuff. We do diets. All these things are to make us better. Why don't we do the same thing for our mental or for our emotional or for our spiritual holistic um, living? So um, if you don't have a counselor, um, a professional counselor where you go pay a copay to, I ain't talking about your friend or your homeboy. I'm talking about someone you paying thirty and sixty dollars or one hundred twenty per hour to go and talk to. Because here's, here's something I also found, April, um, is that where our treasure is is often where our time, where we invest in. So if we're paying for something, we're going to do it. 
Um, versus if you just my friend, I'm not gonna really listen to what you got to say. But if I'm paying one hundred twenty dollars, you better tell me something I can live by, and I'm going to use those principles. Because again, I'm taking my treasure and investing into who I am as as a person. As you all can tell, this is why he was a dream first guest. I mean, it's just dropping. <laughs> I really, really appreciate that. I mean, and it's it's so interesting with you, too, because what I got from you, I remember when we had our pre-interview, I was like, I don't want to know your story. I want to be surprised. Right. I, didn't, I didn't know what I was going to get in, in all of the stages of your evolution. But what I love about you is that you continue to evolve even beyond what that particular situation was. And, I, and that kind of goes into the next question, because I know that in some ways, once you have these experiences, they kind of like alter you. Um, emotional and psychological abuse is is a very debilitating, coercive, altering kind of experience. And when you go and have therapy, as I know and you know, with regard to that particular issue, it shifts you. You have to pick up some tools. So, you know, how are you still dealing with the impact that kind of lingers, the residue of emotional and psychological abuse in all of your current relationships now, in your marriage, you know, as a father, um, with family members or friends professionally? Um, I don't remember the quote directly, but um, it always is the heart of it is you need to be healed before you go and move to new situations or even or actively working on that healing. Because if you respond, a lot of situations that we respond ugly or hateful or, or venomous is because we have not healed appropriately in that moment. Um, and, and that's, that's why I'm constantly evolving. and that's why I'm constantly trying to get better, not just as a professional, but as a husband, as a man, as a father, as a, um, a faith leader. Because um, as you know, with current, current climate, societal um, things that's going on, like you always have to make sure you're guarding your mental and your emotional. Um, this isn't a journey that you go a few times and you good. Like even I am years removed from my previous marriage, um, if I hear something, smell something, or feel something that's uh, reminiscent from that relationship, even in my current relationship, I have to be careful that I don't respond to my current as she was the former. Um, I have to make sure that, and not just talking about previous marriage. Again, a lot of my issues stem from childhood. Um, a lot of my insecurities stem from, you know, not feeling good enough from childhood. And I was not, um, I didn't have the skills or the toolbox to speak, to be able to do that. Um, and like I say, the previous question, I have a standing appointment with a licensed professional counselor. And I also have a life coach that we talk monthly. Those two people are valid, valid and viable in my life, along with the third person in my wife. Um, those, that triangle of accountability, um, for me, keeps me on a track of getting better. We, we started the conversation talking about the difficulties we had even getting to this conversation. Um, uh, it, if you listen to live now or you listen to playback, me and April are going to peel back some layers of onion and tell you that full transparency before the interview even started, I was like, hey, I may not be able to do this because of something else that's going on. But Again, that triangle, my professional counselor, my life coach, my wife, I was able to have a conversation with her. She was like, she let me process. And in that process, um, I was like, I need to get myself together because even in that frustration, it's someone that's going to look back at this playback and, and they're going through something. But at the end of the day, it's, it's one thing that never stands still and it's time. You never get this opportunity to go back and do things over. So you can't avoid the moment. You have to, whatever the chips are, compartmentalize, stay in the moment, handle your business, get that stuff straight, and then go back and, and fix things. Because again, um, even in the space here, like I have a whirlwind of things that I need to take care of, a whirlwind of responsibilities that I need to do, but I need to be present in this moment to be able to help somebody else that may, that's in what I came out of. Um, and not again, not just from a relationship standpoint, like the world can provide these forms of abuse that we're not careful because we don't put those guardrails again, those guardrails in place to say, hey, you're not going to talk to me like this. B, you're not going to treat me like this. And if you do, I can go do something else. 
But I, what, what I can, what I can control is me. I can remove me from the situation. I think the biggest myth uh, of in relationships is that I can change that person. If I love them enough, they will see the love I have for them and they will want to change. That's not true. The only person that can change the heart and minds of anyone. I'm sorry if you listen to this and you're not a faith, faith walker or faith believer, you may be offended at this, but I believe the only person can change a man's heart is God. And last time I checked, I'm not all all knowing, all powerful, and omniscient, and, and uh, omnipresent. I'm just a dude that's in Virginia in this moment of time. I can't touch anything else. So I control what I can control. I change myself. I, I adapt and evolve to the situation I'm in. And that's what I, I would tell who, who's watching this or who will listen back to this playback. You have to control yourself and have and be self-aware enough to make those adjustments. I'm going to take you back, though, because I think for people who may not have heard the interview, um, they might not really get, you know, I think people hear emotional and psychological abuse and they're like, I mean, people say whack stuff all the time. Let it roll off of you. It's not a big deal. You know, I think that they don't really get, in my mind, emotional and psychological abuse is like the, the bridge to all of the other abuses, one. Two, it's like a silent killer because it's so common in our society and so acceptable that people don't even check it. They don't even understand that it's having an impact. So when you see it happen in your family or you see it happen in your friendship group or you see it happen in society, you know, if you're watching something on TV or if you see it happen politically, you know, with all the gaslighting that happens with people of color and women and, you know, LGBT trans folks, all of that stuff that comes up that we're not really thinking about like, okay, well, what does it look like? Or what does it feel like if somebody is in a situation where day in and day out, they hear the worst things about themselves? What kind of impact does that have? And we know, and, and the doctor will tell us, and, and the next one of these that we have, that it's not just a, in a mental and emotional spiritual and psychological impact, it actually has an impact on your physical body. You know, there are a whole host of physical ailments that come along with it, including diabetes and heart disease and all of these things. So can, can you, one, give people a sense of what that actually feels like in your body when you are the constant barrage of someone else's emotional abuse? And then what does a breaking point look like for that? Like, what, does, what happens for you to be like, oh, my God, I have to get away from this and I have to stop? Because I do feel like in, in, like, in the common society, right, folks are just like, it's not a big deal. But it really is. Yeah, that, those questions by themselves is about an hour, two hour conversation. Um, right. But I'm going I'm to give it to you hopefully in like two minutes. Yeah. Um, okay. what, it, what it looks like and it feels like... Um, the example I give is that it happens so often that before it, the, the conversation would happen, I would automatically take myself there and I would do it to myself. So I feel like if I do it to myself, then I don't give you the opportunity to hurt me. I go ahead and get it out of the way. What do, what, what do I mean? What it was like a disarming. So yeah. say what the, like explain what an it would look like so that people understand, okay, this is the type of behavior this is the type of aggression and coercion that was involved. So I, I give you a real simple example. Um, church guy, love wearing my suits. Um, I'm, my, I am Pentecostal, so like that whole movement, um, we are into bright colors. Not everything has to match all the time. Like looking back at it, um, and I'll put on something, and then she will look a certain way. And before she made the derogatory comment, I'm like, man, I look stupid, darling. This, this is dumb. I need to go take this off. Um, and I felt like if I said it, it's not as bad as if you, she said it, or if, if society said it, um, cause I got, I want to make this holistically. Um, I know we're talking about abuse with, uh, you know, in relationships, but that abuse can come from society where you out in public, especially, um, again, I'm not a small dude. Um, so being, you know, what medical science say, I'm obese, um, if I'm putting off, I put on something and it's it's a little snug or it's holding my stomach a little bit, and somebody looking like, man, I'm fat as I don't know what, you know. I'm, I'm doing something to do. I'm I'm working on. I'm working on it. Or somebody says, well, I'm gonna go get another donut. Um, so it's like you kind of laugh it off, so it doesn't hurt, hurt as much. 
But on the inside, like you crying, you broken, like you just like when is somebody gonna see the beauty? When is somebody gonna see the value or the worth that I have? Um the latter part of the question you said, what does that breaking point look like? Um, that breaking point, if we be totally honest, is one of the most um hideous and hurtful and ugliest places to be. Um because now everything that has been said to you negatively, you is, you absorb it, and then now you have an out of body experience when you look at yourself, and you who are, who knows yourself better than anybody are starting to say the same things about yourself. You, you'll never be anything. You ugly. You fat. You stupid. Nobody will ever love you. Nobody will ever like. Why would anybody want to spend time with you? Like you're worthless. So. Not only is the world or the spouse or some other perpetrating that harm, you are doing the same thing to yourself. And it's just like, you know what? I can't, I'm not going to be able to survive. I remember telling my mentor um, years ago, um, um, mental, mental health and, uh, is very important. And when you hear someone else use certain language, you need to make sure you get them help. I'm glad that he was able to give me the help I needed. Uh, I said, dude, I don't want to wake up anymore. I'm tired of living. And like immediately he paused and stopped and said, dude, what are you saying? What do you have a plan? Like all those things clinically he's supposed to say. Um, I said, no, I'm not suicidal. I don't want to eat a bullet. I don't want to slash my wrist. I don't want to jump off a bridge. But I'm just tired. I'm just tired. And and I and this is going to sound real churchy, but I, I'm here for the person that, that is watching this and saying that I can relate, I can relate to that. I don't want to kill myself. I don't want to take my life, but I'm just tired of getting up every day and going in the grind and having to navigate and matriculate through the pain and the anguish. Um, I know what that feels like. Um, being someone that is a life of the party, I love playing, I love joking, I love laughing, I love to eat. And then to say, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to wake up. Like that is a level of despondency that words can't um, articulate. I cannot communicate to you in the English language, um, or I don't have it's, vocabulary has not been yet created to explain what that place looks like. That is the only thing the the analogy and that vibe I just create is the only thing I can kind of wrap my mind. And that's still not even it. It's a deeper and darker place that is more hurtful because. When you as a person say, I don't want to wake up, um, you essentially giving up on everything. Um, and that may sound trivial, but when you are your greatest advocate, you are your biggest fan, and you are saying to yourself, I don't want to live for myself, or I don't want to do for myself, like, what, what can anybody else do? No one else can, can inspire that. I can't speak into that. I can't pray that out. I can't take you out to dinner enough. I can't tell you how you're beautiful enough. You have to make a decision either, and it's as plain as this, either you're going to live or you're going to die. And I chose in that moment um, with my mentor um, that I was going to live. Um, I was going to not live for another person. Um, if at that point, I wasn't even, I wasn't even married then. I wasn't even checking for Michelle. I just wanted to be holistically well for myself um because a lot of people say this whole 50 50 when it comes out of relationships i don't ascribe to that it's 100 100. you have to you have to be close as being complete as a whole person as you can be because no one else can make you feel whole no one else can validate you um that's a myth um and a lot of people may argue with me with that and i'm fine um no one can validate who you are you have to believe and trust and the greatness of who you who you are. Uh, my wife is my biggest cheerleader, but if my wife decides, and please, Michelle, if you're watching this, don't leave me. I, I'm gonna go play in traffic. I'm playing. Um, but if she decided today that like, I don't want to be with you anymore, I'm gonna be okay. Um, I got my. I love my kids, but if my kids say, "Yo, I don't want you to be my dad no more. I don't look at you as my father. No more. It's gonna hurt, but I'm gonna be okay. I'm gonna find the pieces of my life and put them back together." Um, because for me, my divorce was the lowest part of my life, bar none, because um, it was a level of failure, a level of rejection, a level of embarrassment, 
a level of pain and a level of hurt. Don't mistake pain and hurt to be synonymous with one another. That they're not. Um, and and I'm here talking to you uh, with a smile on my face, um, enjoying the best times of my life. If y'all follow me on IG or Facebook, y'all y'all see I'm having the best days of my life. Um, but I also know what the worst days look like, um, and I I do my very best never to go back to those dark places. Yeah, let's go into that because I know that therapy and counseling, you got your little triangulation thing going down so that you always have somebody that's got your back that holds you accountable. And there are certain things that you can't do in your intimate relationships that you can do with someone who is outside of those places that can give you perspective. And I say this to people all the time. You know, everybody that knows me personally, they know I'm like, yeah, you should go get a therapist. Everybody needs a therapist. Like, your friends are not your therapists. Mm -hmm. They're not. Just don't do not do that. And don't do that to them, but also don't do that to yourself. Don't do that to your relationships, right? And and so, and, and they're, they're just skills and tools that you, you get from someone who has that level of training and that acumen that you can't get from normal people who don't have an acumen right. for that. Tell me what it is that you, you know, first of all, again, congratulations for your accomplishment in getting your counseling degree. Thank you. But tell me what you learned in therapy and, and if that had something to do with you going on this path, because it really does sound like that experience shifted your life and said, okay, this is now another part of who I need to be in the world as a part of my vocation. So talk to me about, you know, those tools and, and clearly the additional tools that you're getting from learning how to do this as, as a part of your craft now. Um, and I also want to, to that point, I want to also speak to those who are counselors and all that kind of stuff and aspiring to do, go down this path. Do not go down this path thinking that your education is going to fix you and you don't need a counselor. All of this does, this, this whole counsel thing, it shows you the tools to help others and to, and to hopefully set up some guardrails, but you cannot counsel yourself. So I'm glad that you said that. Um, and if your friends are counselors, don't try to be cheap and use your friend not to get, no, invest, because what you said is, is key and it's paramount. Um, and that's the re one of the reasons why, um, this, now this is a very controversial statement I'm about to make. I, my counselors don't look like me. Um, my professional counselors don't look like me because I don't need someone to under, how can I say it to make sense? I don't need someone, or I, I don't feel the need to have to get an African-American counselor, male or female, to identify with me because of the color of their skin. Because you can be black and be black and not be able to relate to me and not to be able to, to, to um, interact with me. And this, this is just Jason. This, I'm not saying this is for everybody. But I had to learn that what I needed had to trans, transcend color ethnicity and religion and creed. Um, one of my counselors don't, it's not even a Christ follower. That's not, I'm not coming to you for, for my religion. I'm not coming to you for give me, um, how shall I live as a Christian? I'm asking you to help me. And, and, oh man, it's so great. I'm not even asking you to tell me what to do. I just need a, a safe space so I can talk. Um, if, if, the truth of the matter is, what we have right now is a counseling session for myself. This and those who are on IG or who watch the replay of this, y'all just in a, a counseling session that me and April are having because this is a safe place that I trust her. She trusts me, where I can talk to her. She can talk back to me. That's what counseling is for me. Um, I don't go to my counselor asking him or her to solve my problems. I don't go to my life coach say, "Here's a problem, fix it." Um, and I even learned that professionally. One of my um, one of my bosses. Like, um, I went to, I go to him often, we talk, and one of the jokes we have, he's like, I'm not going to fix your problem for you. I'm going to listen to you, and I'll give you direction, but I'm not going to tell you what to do. Um, and at first, I'm like, oh, that's, that's rough. Like, you my boss, tell me what to do. But I learned that there's wisdom in that. Because if I ever tell you, if I always tell you what to do and you do it, it's like the parable, is it better to give you a fish, or is it better to show you how to fish? Because one day, I'm not going to be here anymore. So when I die, do you now die? So you have to be able to speak into legacy, and that's what counseling does. Um, and I think to the latter part of your question is what tools um, did that provide for me? It helped me to understand the life stage I'm in. It helped me to understand my kids. 
Um, I have a one-year-old, God bless him, I love him. And I have an almost 13-year-old, God bless her, I love her. But it's sometimes where I don't understand these jokes. I don't understand why my almost 13-year-old sometimes gets emotional and just cries because she's upset. Like, stop crying, listen to it, fix it, and move on. But there's a level of emotion and emoting that she needs to do, and that's okay. Um, full transparency. And y'all get, getting a lot of stuff that I know people wouldn't get from me. Um, me and my wife had a conversation where I was in tears, and, like, she saw anger. Now, not to her. Now, let's make sure we, we are very clear. Not being abusive to her, not being, like, combative, but, like, to hurt anger where tears, I'm just like, oh, man. But it's, I needed that space. So in that moment, it made me remember how my daughter acclimates. She needs a space to emote. With my son, um, he's in that autonomy versus uh, mistrust phase. Um, and he's trying to figure something out and can't get it, gets angry. And like, he, ah! Before I did human um, um, lifespan development, I'm like, he need a whooping. Like, what's wrong with you? But now understanding the life stage that he's in and he's just trying to learn, he doesn't have the words to articulate. So counseling and this journey that I went in, unbeknown to me, because when I went on this, this journey, it was because at my previous place of employment, I hated my job. And I'm like, what am I good at? I'm good at talking to people and solving their problems. What does that? Counseling. That's how we arrived today. Unbeknown to me that counseling was going to do more for me as a man, a professional father, and a faithful leader than anything any other life decision to date could do for me. Um, so I, those are some of the nuggets that, that this journey has, has shown me. Let me go back to the same piece because, you know, in the spirit of full, full transparency with our audience, um, Jason and I have both been talking over, you know, doing this presentation and, and <clears throat> some things that have gone on both with both of us that are mountains to, uh, <laughs> to overcome. And I, I don't think that we're alone. So we have no shame or, 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 um, or guilt about is speaking publicly about things that, that have been happening for us. You know, my battle with complex PTSD and in things that are happening for him. You know, one of the things that I think about in, in this is how in the, sp in the space of an upset and in the space of something that may not be easily, easy for other people to see or translate how important it is for the people around you to be safe containers for whatever it is that you need to evolve through. However, it is also inappropriate for you to just take anything from people, especially if they're caustic and venomous, like you said. Um, what would you say, especially around emotional and psychological abuse, because I think a lot of this feels like, you know, therapy. And I, by the way, many, many people have said, we need to do a show just on therapy and counseling alone because it's, su it's such a, a topic that people are interested in, one, but also like trying to navigate and, and figure out where do they fit in and does this really work and do I really have to do the work and is the work really as ugly as it is? And yes, it is ugly, but ugly it's, jacks. it's real ugly. We can both tell you it's ugly, but there's beauty and, and there's freedom on the other side of that. But the tools for getting out of emotional and psychological abuse, I think, are are important to kind of identify and talk about. And the reason why I want you to speak to it is because the number, the number two thing that people said, besides your vulnerability, the number two things that people said about the interview itself was, I love how in the space that he created to talk about the pain he experienced in his relationship, he gave that woman deference, grace, and respect. Okay, it takes us some time to get there, right? That doesn't happen overnight, especially when you are the quote unquote victim and then you become the survivor. So tell me about coming from the space where you were the, the, the torrent of that abuse and then you came over to the other side and you were able to get to this point of being able to articulate, I wish her blessings. Talk about that journey a little bit. Because I had to own, I had to own my own stuff. Um, we, we didn't get divorced just because um, she was a bad wife. We got divorced because it was some bad things happening. Um, 
and not all those things. Well, I, I, I would never say I was uh, verbally or emotionally, or never physically abusive to her. Um, it was some things I could have done better. It was some ways I could, I could have communicated with her better. It's some ways I could have been more accountable to her. Um, so, and then also knowing that as much as I hurt, and this is where maturity really came, kicked in. Um, as much as I hurt, she was hurting too. Um, she had her own things that she was dealing with. And, you know, her confidentiality, I'll never divulge those things. Um, but she had, and I knew that. Um, so, and because anybody tell you, I'm one of the nicest people that you're ever going to meet, I'm never going to do something on purpose to hurt you. Now, can I be petty? Yes, I can. I have a shirt that says, God ain't petty, but I am. And 100%. I am very petty. Um, I, uh, one of my life coaches, I like to say I'm not petty, I'm passive aggressive um, or interchange the two. But I recognize and realize that she was hurting too. And I know how I felt when I was hurt. Do I want some, if I'm bleeding, do I want someone to stab me more or do I want somebody to give me help? I want somebody to give me help. Um, one of the, one of the greatest things that, um, and again, this is not a religious show, but one of the greatest things that Christ told us when the question was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And it wasn't, you know, love you. It wasn't, you know, treat your wife a certain way. It wasn't don't steal, don't kill, don't be a racist. Don't, it was love, love yourself and love others. Paraphrase it. It was, it was a lot, but the, the bottom line was to love yourself and treat others the way you want to be treated. That was it. That was his principle. That was everything that's in Christianity funnels around that one truth. And that and going through that, that's where my faith got the strongest. Did because, you really, so at what point did you realize, okay, her pain is so big and my inability to handle it. I don't have the tools for this. What do I do? Was that the moment where you're like, okay, I gotta, I, I can't do this, and she is also probably not in the space where she can accept this from me at this point because we've gone too far. Like, talk about that murky space because at this point you're deflecting, and at that point she's also like, you know, you're her supply for like, okay, my trauma is showing up in this way, and I don't know any other way to communicate this than to interact with you this way because I don't have tools to deal with my trauma and they show up in this way and you don't have the tools to take on my trauma and you're trying to obfuscate all the time. Yeah, basically, um, sum up in one sentence, when I, I figured out I could be bad by myself. That's it, point blank. Mm -hmm. um, that was a long time coming. Um, because it, I made a lot of, like you say, I made a lot of excuses. Um, you know, it'll get better after a while. If I love her enough, she'll change. If I do this, she'll change. If I buy her this, she'll change. If I buy this house, she'll she'll change. But nah, my again, I had to sit in that moment. If nothing changes, then I'm out, am I okay? No. All right, so what you gonna do about it, Jason? And the, and those years where I wrestled with it, because it was years, we didn't divorce, like it didn't happen overnight. Um it was over the course of three to four years uh where we we wrestled with that. Um we had interventions, if you will, from close friends. That's why I said, don't listen to your friends. Your friends are your friends to hang out, have fun with. They're not your friends. And hear me, there's a balance. They're not your friends to get um, therapeutic advice from. That's, that's not what they do. Even if they're licensed and they have 26 letters behind their name, those 26 letters don't apply to you. Go find someone that doesn't have a relationship with you to be able to speak into you. Um, because, you, again, you're respected more because one of the downfalls for me, people were telling me what to do and what not to do, but because we had a relationship, I was picking apart and, and rationalizing why they were telling me that. Because I was like, well, they got this going on in their life. So if they can deal with that, then I can deal with this. Their that wasn't my this. It didn't equate. Two different things. Um, so again, learning that I can't listen to everybody and then like I can, I can I could be miserable by myself. I could be angry by myself. I don't need somebody else. Like I don't need this. I don't need. But I don't need a punching bag. I don't need to be a punching bag. 
So both of those things are, um, are one of the main reasons why I was like, nah, it's time to go do something else. And then went ahead and, and did it. Because um, another thing, uh, I was talking to another, a friend of mine the other day. Um, when she heard, like, go back to the original question, when she heard uh, the, the show, she was like, um, it's very rare you hear of a man filing for divorce. It's very rare that you hear of a man leaving. So there had to be some problems why you didn't want to be there. And it was like, there were problems, but it was just like, you have to be a man and, and own up to what it is. If I'm going to stay here, I'm going to be 100% in here. If I'm not going to be here, I'm going to be 100% out. And then wish them well. Because the only way I can be holistically healed or even aspire to be that is when I totally relinquish that and let that go. Because here's the thing. If I'm angry with her and wishing her um, death and, like, she don't have any money or, like, she get coronavirus or something like that, um, there's a place of power that I'm still, like, put into that situation and energy that I need to let go so I can really embrace the future I have. Um, and I promise you, I don't, I don't second guess that decision. I don't second guess the decision. To say, if I saw her today, we could have a great conversation. I change the tire. If she, if she was hungry, I buy her something to eat. I don't wish her, I don't wish her, you know, ill. Um, I'm not gonna pay her car payment. I'm not gonna pay her rent and her mortgage. That's not wise. But if she was like, it's a meme that's of the, of the ex in the water and said, what would you do if you saw him in the water? Three words, you said, let him die. I'm now, I'm not going to jump in the water. I can't swim. But I'm going to try to do something to help her. You know, I'm not going to, my point is, Ms. April, <laughs> I'm not going to do anything at a detriment of myself to, you know, make sure she's good. But at the same time, I'm not going to be petty. I'm not like, even on Facebook, I see people that go, going through divorces and they throw these little petty jabs at one another. Like, you look at my timeline, I've never done that. I've never said, um, yeah, I'm trying to make sure. Yeah, I've never said anything like sideways or slick. And it's because, like, I'm either 100% in or 100% out. I don't, I, we don't play those games where we continue to give energy to something that doesn't, doesn't deserve my energy and my time. Um, again, 100%. Wish her well. Hope everything's going great with her. Um, I hope I, you know, everything, she she get everything she, she's ever wanted. But, you know, that you, you have to learn how to really move on. You cannot move on holding on to that. Right. Um, so someone's listening to this right now and they are an abuser or someone being abused in this way. What do you say to them? Uh, don't ignore the signs. Don't make excuses. If you feel the abuse, don't ignore the signs and don't um, make excuses for him or her. Um, don't allow, even their life experiences, that shouldn't dedicate, dictate, rather, I'm sorry, how they treat you. Don't let, because his, her, her father wasn't there. Now, you got to make up a conversation with her. No, you're her husband. You're not her dad. Um, because you know the mother wasn't engaged with him, you're not her, you're not his mother. You're his wife. Um, don't try to compensate for those things. If you are the abuser, um, check check your heart. Why are you doing this? Like legitimately, are you doing this because you legitimately hate them, or are you doing this because you really don't like yourself? I promise you. I promise you, hundred percent. Not and I, I'll. Everything I have in the bank, I'll put it on this. It's not because you really hate them. It's really you don't really like yourself. And you don't want to do that hard work because um, in, a, in a few moments we have left to share, um, and I hope we can have a follow-up conversation about therapy and the importance of it. And that's a whole other conversation. Um, yes. You need to go do some work because when you do therapy, it shows you the ugliest portions of who you are. Um, and then now you got you to stay there. <laughs> And you got to look at it. Now, you don't have to, but that's why I said my divorce and that whole process was the worst part of my life because I had to sit in that and, like, see how ugly it was. See what I did to cause that. See the things that really was what it was, and it was my fault. Now I got to do something to fix it because before there was ever Michelle, before there was ever LMC1 and LMC2, I had to be good. 
Um, and to be good, therapy was essential. Um, prayer, um, you know, having a relationship with your higher power, that's essential too. That's not take away from that. But if God gives us other tools. The same way if I have a headache, I'm going to pray ask God to heal it. But God also gave man the wisdom to make a Tylenol. I'm going to go grab a glass of Tylenol and I'm going to grab a glass of water and take this Tylenol and believe God for the healing. Now, God, if you heal me before this Tylenol, I take it. Thank you. But if you don't, allow this to help me. Um, so that, 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 is, that is imperative. imperative. Um, you know, I'm big on bystanders because I think bystanders either um, rescue you, save you, help you, or they kick you further down the hole. Um, it's tricky with emotional and psychological abuse because people really don't know what to do. Um, they tend to kind of make jokes about it or um, make people, you know, obnoxiously characteristic around those, those behaviors or they just want to dip out. Um, so people who are in the space of trying to care for folks, what, what do you say to them? Um, so much. <laughs> you asked these like these huge questions. We got a few minutes left, but I'm gonna give it to you. Um, and my Baptist three points in the close. Um, if you're a bystander and you see this, um, like, don't play with it. Like, it's not funny. It's not cute. And also have some grace. I said that the first time when we talk. Have some grace. It's very easy for you to sit back in, in your glass house and say, if that was me, I wouldn't take it. I would leave. But you don't know, like, you really love this person. You really have a relationship with this person. Um, and it was something that attracted you to this person. Um, that's a real thing. So, like, be cognizant of those relationships. Be cognizant of, like, the care. I, I think the number one word, I would say care. Um, because you go home to, to your cushiony life, and that person is still in that moment. Like you don't know what it what what you don't know what it takes to not only leave but to start over because make no mistake about it you have to start over. Um, so be if, if you're going to be there, be there for a long haul. If you don't want to be there, then check out, be gone. But you have to be respectful. You you don't have to be. My suggest my strong suggestion is you should be very respectful um, and, and show grace because um, I told again go back to the last show. I didn't have a lot of grace and a lot of um, um, energy for people who got divorces. I'm like, yo, how can you be married to somebody for 20 something, 30 years and decide to get a divorce? Like, you never loved this person in the first place. And then I got a divorce and it was like, oh, snap. I get it. I, I understand. So my grace and my mercy for people is huge. To not only go to divorce, but Go through any form of, of abuse, um, even scandals. No, we're not even talking about scandals. Because at the end of the day, we all got that one thing that if somebody had a camera and put us on IG or Facebook or Twitter, yeah. Oh, that's a whole sermon. Yes, it is. Um, yeah. Look, we have some people joining us right now. Um, Dr. Carter just came in. I got to give a shout out to her because um, she, she really did some beautiful work on this um, podcast. Mm -hmm. um, around um so you look we we have i'm gonna squeeze a couple more minutes out of you because you know i've been wanting to have this conversation with you and dr carter because so much has been popping off in mainstream society with people exhibiting like really caustic emotionally and psychologically abusive behavior i am not naming names because i am not that chick but right. we have seen it and it's been on display with all of these people who have so much social capital. And, you know, every time I see it and every time I experience it, we can talk about, okay, we know how that came down. We know culturally this is what it is. We know how people co-sign it. But in order for us to dismantle it, we really start, to, we need to start addressing it. So every time something like that comes up, it is like this overwhelming support from the public for this kind of behavior. It's like unbelievable to me. So tell me what kind of insights you would offer in the space of that. I mean, especially with what you do, with what you know that kind of culture can be. Tell me, 
as someone who has experienced emotional and psychological abuse, you know the impact of it, you know what it has done, you know how you still have to work through things because once it's, it's an experience that you had, you, you're constantly navigating it, right? Tell me what you would say. I mean, if you're having a conversation with your people and this whole topic comes up and folks start popping off and being like, oh, you know, such and such is soft. Or, oh, you know, he was too old to deal with that. So tell me what you would say to them. Hey, I'm punching your face. <laughs> like, that, that's, yeah. that's what goes. That, that's what goes. I like, I like. I'm, we, okay, listen, we don't advocate violence. That was a joke. But it, it does really anger me. And the reason why it angers me is, is because like it's again going back to the, the previous question it's really easy for you to say what you wouldn't do because you're not the one that's doing it it like it was a joke um and I, i'm not gonna say the joke because i don't want to trigger anybody but it was a joke that i, I, I made fun of my cousin of uh, you know uh, the parents thing that he had and 20 some years later i got that same that same thing going on with me um and i look back on it was like um, is this karma? Is this coming back to me because I made fun of him for going through that? Um, so when mainstream media and like honestly, like come off Facebook because Facebook is an illusion. Uh, Twitter is an illusion. Like that stuff isn't real. And you glamorizing this behavior and the mistreatment of women and the mistreatment of men and like like the myth is a man can't be sexually assaulted, right? Like how did that happen? You no. Know, you want it in some kind of way. Just because old girl got a banging body don't mean that you wanted her on you. Um, and vice versa, if a female is very attractive and she's wearing a short skirt and a tight top and she's, you know, got the shape, oh, she invited that behavior. She can't just want to wear what she want to wear without being checked. Like, let me live. It, like, it, now I don't suggest this, but if a very attractive female want to walk down the street naked, that's her prerogative. That don't mean that in turn, as a man, I lose control and got to sexually assault her. No. Or, like, if someone's doing something real stupid, then I got to address it and be abusive to them. Like, no. Be able to speak in those situations with love, with respect and integrity, and with the intelligence. If this was you, again, it goes back to the, the original thing. How would you want to be treated in this moment? If you made that same mistake, because there's been some times like being married to Michelle and Dr. Carter's up here, um, I've made some, I've done some bonehead things because I'm a man. And sometimes we just do things in our mind that make sense. And Michelle's like, and her, I know her head. She's like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. But you know how she treats me? She don't say anything. And, and one of the reasons why I love her so much, I could make a mistake in public. She'll never check me in public. She'll guard me and make sure that I don't continue in that folly. Like, like we have things we do, so I know if I go too far, like she'll she'll like scratch my leg, or like she'll like you know rub my elbow, and in my head I'm like, okay, I need to pull back, I need to ease up off this. We get in the car, and again, a lot of times our kids are with us, we don't even have that conversation in front of our kids because she doesn't want LM, LMC one to to see or hear like us have those conversations because she don't want her to feel like that she's belittling me in that moment. Um, and then also, we don't, Michelle knows all my secrets, like 100%, everything. Um, there's, there's nothing a female can tell her or a male can tell her that she doesn't already know. Um, but with those secrets, there's not ammunition for her to hit me when I'm low. Um, but that, yes. that's because of trust. Um, so, so many things, like stop glamorizing this foolishness. Stop saying if you're a man and you cry, you soft. Stop saying if you're a female and you out here short stuff, you inviting un unwarranted attention. No, let these folk live. If you can't speak intelligently and with love to their situation, leave them alone. But always like have a truth teller in your corner. I have three to four different truth tellers in my corner that I know if they say something, it's because they love me. I have other people in my life that you know, think they know me and they say things. I'm like, all right, yeah, whatever. And I keep moving. Know the difference. Mm. Um, but at no time should, should you allow yourself to be belittled, berated, or made feel less than. And then now, as a coping mechanism, you start deflecting. And before they can say it, you start doing it. Like, let's, let's start normalizing, treating people right and doing things the right way. Yeah. I love that answer. Thank you. Um, 
tell us about your podcast with your wife and how people can find it. Listen, right behind me, selfless plug. Thank you, Miss April. Family Functions Podcast. We want every um, podcast. Spotify, um, Apple Podcast, and the whole heart behind Family Functions, we have what we call a function key. And those are words that we live by. Um, and those podcasts, we, we've talked about different things like what we're talking about now, divorce recovery. We talked about having a blended family and the, the dynamics in that. Um, and then when we have these conversations, even when we talk about divorce recovery, we don't go into depth about what happened on the other side with the other person because we don't know what, why that happened. We deal with what happened with us. And we try to make sure that all our function keys are things that, um, like a sentence, no more than a sentence that you can apply to your everyday life. So listen, uh, we completed the first season of Family Functions. We have new programming that's going to drop in a um, very few weeks. Um, and um, I'm doing it with my best friend. Like um, some of our greatest podcasts, it came from a conversation we had while we were driving home from work. We said, you know what? Let's put it, let's put this on on wax. Um, and we are. If you think I'm vulnerable, Michelle surprised me with her vulnerability because she's a private person. Dr. Carter can tell you she don't be talking about her business. But I put that microphone in front of her face. She started telling something. I'm like, wait. Like we uh, had an episode uh, talking about uh, infertility and how we dealt with infertility for years. Um, we were around people having babies. Um, Dr. Carter, she having four five babies, and I'm like, God, what's wrong with us? <laughs> um, and we talk about those real feelings about the miscarriages, the ectopic pregnancy, um, that whole journey. So we are very, very candid. Um, if you want to laugh and have fun and cry all at the same time, check us out. Um, our episodes um, drop on Thursdays. Um, they'll resume back in July, um, the first week in July. So every Thursday, it'll be a new show. But go check out everything that's up there. Um, right now, um, sorry, Dr. Carr, I love you. Um, we have some, a lot of different conversations. Um, and we will also invite out to actually have that same forum at, um, at, at, at a church. We've done talks other places. We have other guests coming on. And who knows, y'all might see Miss April up there on one of our podcasts, too, um, talking about some things. Um, so check it out, Family Functions Podcast on any um, podcasting platform. We're there. All right. So, you know, I'm a music person. I know you're a music person. So what is your personal anthem right now and why? Mm. That That is, oh, man. Um, anywhere from It Is Well, um, the hymn to uh, mm -hmm. Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. Um, like, that's just where we are right now. That's the spectrum. Like at the end of the day, everything is going on. Like the turmoil, the frustration, the cultural wars, and everybody just said everybody cattiness. Um, whatever comes my way, um, God is well with my soul. And then that whole what's going on vibe. Like everything he he sung about in that decade in that time frame, we looking at it right now. So um, if you get in my car, that that's on my iPod, and that's that's. All right, uh, Jason, I could say so much about you, but I think everybody gets to feel um, tactically. I love video and podcasting is hard for me now because I'm like, I need people to see this. <laughs> you know, I need to see this, feel the interaction. So we might be redoing this whole thing and making it all Instagram in a minute. So I'm just saying, because I, I just like the feel of this. Um, I can't thank you enough for sharing your personal story with vulnerability and great um, passion. Um, and honesty and just really digging into the places that are really uncomfortable for you and also making it like really live and, and vibrant for other people. Um, I think that's a gift that you have. Congratulations again on your counseling degree. Watch out, Dr. Thank Carter, he's coming for your people. Um, <laughs> just thank you so much for being who you are and, and I'm grateful that you've been able to share this and anytime you need me for anything, I'm grateful. Um, to, to all of you, um, this is my maiden voyage. This is my first Instagram Live, 
Um, I don't know if you know a little bit about my background, and I'm, I'm sure I'll do an Instagram live with a couple of my friends that, who know like the body of my work. I had a nonprofit for like almost a decade and a half where we use documentary film to encourage dialogue about social issues. So this is something that's very close to my heart. Um, I had a show in my hometown, Amplify Baltimore, where I was trying to amplify the great things about my hometown. There's still many things that are beautiful about that place, even though it's challenged. Um, and I want to do that for this nation. Um, I am a daughter of this nation. I am the descendant of the enslaved in, in this country. And it's something that's really important to me that I amplify voices from diverse walks of life who are all trying to make this nation stronger and better for their communities, for their families. Um, and, and, and that is a very important call for me. So a big, big, big deal for me is to not just have these conversations where we're kind of voyeuristically looking into people's business or listening to, you know, experts and advocates talk about what they do. It is a call to action. It's important to get you all engaged in action. And I'm hoping that something that you heard on podcast or something that you heard today um, has informed you in a way that makes you say, I need to take greater steps. I need to figure out how I can be more active and less passive about this issue. So if you go to amplifyamerica.com, we have an engage page. At that engage page, we have a social action card. And that is like a prompt. So you could use the social action card for any issue that you're dealing with or this particular issue. And it just invites you to kind of identify people who are having this issue and, and build compassion and empathy for their lived experience, like what we're hoping we did with Jason. And it's also inviting you to look for experts and advocates so you can figure out what are the best practices with regard to this. What are people doing every day, every day to empower and embolden some solutions in this space? And then to come up with tenable solutions that you think you can participate in and then to get to the point where you can identify opportunities for you to show up in your communities where you can volunteer, where you can offer um, your talent. So please engage where you live. Please empower yourself and the people that you care about to do this work where you live because that's where the change really happens. It's in us and collectively in our communities. Also, I invite you to support this effort. Um, please follow us here on Instagram, follow us on Twitter, donate, become a patron. $2 a month, $10 a month, 10 cents a month. It helps defray the cost of all of this because none of this is free. Um, you can do that on Podbean or you can make a donation on Venmo or Cash App at Amplify America. You can get gear. Cute t-shirt, right? Bonfire yeah, tees. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to send me one. I mean, you know, I mean, bonfire tees. We got them there. We got gear. I actually even have a black collection because I have a friend that needs stuff in black and white. I'm like, okay, you want stuff in black and white? We got you. So go to um, Bonfire Tees there. You can get all of that information on our website. You can find out more information about Dr. Carter and Jason on the website. You can find out more information about who I am, what I've been doing for the past 25 years around civic engagement. Um, I just want you all to know that, like, this is a burgeoning movement. It is not mine. It does not belong to me. It is The show is called Amplify America with... April Yvonne Garrett, I'm just somebody who's just trying to like lay the foundation so that people can connect. That's always been my life work and anybody that knows me knows that that is my heart. There are some people who came on today that I love, love, love. Alyssa, Amy, Gordon, thank you so much for showing up. People that I don't know, I love you too. Thank you for showing up because I know it's important that when anybody takes time out of their day to engage this, um, and that's a gift and that's a blessing to me because nobody has to support what you're doing and nobody has to be here for what you're about. Um, if you're new to this community, welcome. Make this your home. Come back. Talk to us. Tell us what you want to see. Right now, I have 52 episodes in my head about things that I want to deal with. Like I said before in the beginning of this, the next episodes are going to be on domestic and intimate partner violence, sexual trauma, human trafficking, and elder abuse. They are all heavy. I absolutely expect for you to come and do work with me but I will never leave you alone. You will never do the work alone. If you were triggered, you will always have resources where you can go get help. That's the whole point of this. So please know that coming here, I'm trying to build community and communion, not just with the people that I present with you, present you with, but also in your community so that you can have the tools to build those communities amongst yourselves. And um, hopefully you will always find in this space a place where you're emboldened to not only support things that matter to you, but also have the tools so that you can make them better. So, Jason, you have any final words? Um, don't, don't, don't ignore the signs. Do the work. Yeah. Um, once you do the work, you will feel so much better. But it is work. But um, 
be committed, be committed to yourself. And if you commit to yourself, everything else will happen the way it needs to happen. Right, right. So hopefully the next one of these we're doing, we'll have Dr. Carter and then we can kind of get into that little therapy conversation a little bit more. Um, she did yeah. a beautiful job on the podcast. If, if you were one of those people who said, I got through, through Jason and I, I got to get to the rest of it, do yourself a favor and go back and listen. Take the time. I know, um, you know, it's not the sexiest presentation because I really do want to be sober with you because I want you to employ your critical thinking skills and not to come through my lens or, you know, anybody else's lens. I want you to get this for yourself. But go back and listen to that, the part of, of the interview where Dr. Carter explains how she engages people who are going on this journey and what skill set she's employing them with. And, and also the process of therapy because, you know, people think they're in therapy forever. No, you go in when you need some tools and then you get about trust we, two people who can tell you, you know, it's, it's something that you do and then you take a break, you know, and then you can always go back to a good therapist or find another type of therapist. But it's, it's one of those things that's always there for you. So it's, it's really important that I want you to re-engage that space. Again, the next episode is, um, to, is examining an intimate partner in domestic violence with Ruth Glenn, who is the president of the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Amazing. Ruth Andam is a philanthropist, businesswoman, and domestic violence survivor. She is amazing. She um, it, it had she owned the the three McDonald's restaurants in the Denver airport. She is not playing. Um, and then Nicole Castile is the program director for the Rose Andam Center that um, Miss Andam um, endowed because of her history with domestic violence and domestic violence in her family. So please, please, please um, be patient with us as we're trying to get through editing. Thank you, Jason, for helping. Um, <laughs> I just pulled you into that, by the way. Ain't no um, problem. And I, I, I do hope you will listen and share. But again, I just want to thank you guys so much for taking time out of your busy schedule and being with us. Um, tell me how you feel about this. Send me emails. Um, get in my inbox, um, at my DMs. I'm sorry, I'm so old. My DMs here and let me know what you're thinking about this. Um, and, and if you want to see more of this and if you want to see this primarily, um, let me know how you feel about it because this is uh, a movable feast and you get to decide, find the space and what's useful to you. And I'm, I'm here to make sure that this is effective as possible. So thank you so much for taking time with us today. Hey, Jason, we did it. Like, you know, we were in like crisis mode a little bit earlier and we got yeah. through it. And things that I know is like, whenever I'm going through like a darker moment or it feels heavy, service always makes me feel better. Do you feel that yeah. way too? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This is therapy. Y'all had y'all were in my therapy session today, and I feel better. So I'm, I'm gonna finish yeah. the rest of this work today. Right, exactly. So thank you guys for being with us today. We will see you again very soon. Enjoy the beauty of this day and always amplify America. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.